You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Can we believe the Gospel accounts? Well, that's a fair question. The Gospel accounts are both ordinary and astonishing. They portray aspects of ordinary life in the regions of Galilee, Samaria and Judea in the first century, whilst at the same time chronicling some extraordinary interactions with Jesus, a preacher of the gospel of the kingdom of God, who lived an incredible life and could do amazing things. The gospels give an account of a man whose message was both attractive and challenging. He was able to heal the sick so much so that people flocked to him to be cured. And yet his priority was to preach the message of the kingdom of God. The climax of all the gospel records is that Jesus' teaching brought him into conflict with the Jewish authorities, who then persuaded the Roman governor by employing a baying mob and stoking up fear of rebellion against the empire to have Jesus cruelly executed by crucifixion. But the real climax of the story, however, is that three days later, God raised Jesus from the dead, and he's seen by over 500 witnesses before being taken into heaven, an event again witnessed by his disciples. So What you're going to get from me really is personal reasons why I believe those gospel accounts, because I do believe that they are true and they they write about things that really happened. I've summarised some of my reasons for being confident the gospel accounts are real and believable on the screen, while at the same time, obviously the events are also extraordinary, never mind real and believable. And I'm sure that the gospel records were provided by people who were witnesses of Jesus himself. They they lived at the same time. And I'm sure that they are rooted in real history about real people who lived in real places. Most of all, the man who is the chief protagonist of each of the records is astonishing because of what he said, because of what he did, and because of who he was. The compassion, the care he showed for others, the message of hope he brought, the way of life he advocates, are all worthy of anyone's time and consideration. Jesus of Nazareth is nothing short of radical and incredible, attractive, incredibly attractive personality and someone worth trying to follow. I don't know whether I'll convince you or not, but I do know that the gospel message is worth reading and I recommend that you do read it if you can. So the first piece of evidence I want to give is to look at people in the Gospels. The the slides show people who have been verified by extra biblical pieces of evidence so that they are confirmed to be real. And that might be coins or it might be documents, it might be monuments, tombstones, ossuaries, which are uh, bone boxes that we used in the first century and so on. Various different pieces of evidence. The list on the slide shows 30 people who are known to be real in the New Testament. And so in that case, if we didn't have a Bible to tell us about them, we would still know that they existed because they are part of history. Here's some of the kind of evidence um, that's typical that might be considered. So, So specifically on the screen, we've got a papyrus manuscript of Flavius Josephus, the Roman Jewish historian. There's a manuscript of Tacitus, um, the Roman historian, there's an ossuary, a bone box, um, that is reported to have contained the bones of Caiaphas, a high priest in the time of Jesus. There's an inscription of Pilate, procur- procurator of Judea during the time of Jesus' ministry. And there's various coins that uh, show the, the Herodian family dynasty. Um, there were kings in the region around that time, or tetrarchs. Um, and there are Roman coins of the emperors of that time of Augustus and Tiberius. So going back to that list, you can see that 
half or slightly more than half of all the names mentioned in the New Testament um, that are shown to be real by other evidence are mentioned in the gospel records. And that gives me confidence that the record was written about events that involve real people in the time that the gospels were brought to describe. The gospels were not fiction or fiction attempting to masquerade as history. The level of research to achieve something like that would be way too high. And when you put alongside that, that each of the four gospel records are in harmony with each other, this becomes even more convincing. By harmony, I mean that they're not identical records, and that's obvious when you read them, but the incidental details and the places where they share a narrative show that they are reporting the same source, but from different witnesses, from the, the, the view of different witnesses to the ministry of Jesus. Let's have a look at one particular passage which, which displays um, how the, the Gospels are rooted in history in, in the sense of the people that they talk about. Uh, and what I want to look at is this list here in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, which, which lists various people um, who, are the, who were there at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Luke is, is writing a history and he's telling, he's telling us at what time Jesus' ministry started. And he uses all these different rulers who were ruling at that time to, to pinpoint that moment. So he records the dates of prominence of well-known people of the, time, of the time and the place where they ruled. So in the 15th year of Tiberius, Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod was Tetrarch of Galilee, Philip, Tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, and also John the Baptist um, was in the wilderness. And all the details are correct. Uh, Judah didn't always have a governor. Galilee, Iturea, Trachonitis and Abilene weren't always ruled by a tetrarch, but they were at this time. Caiaphas um, was Annas' son-in-law and he was the official high priest at the time. Annas had previously been high priest, but he was head of that family. Um, the, his family followed on as high priest throughout that period. And he had such influence that he was also always considered to have the status of high priest, uh, as particularly at this time. Uh, and John the Baptist was known to be a preacher in the wilderness. Uh, and these can be confirmed by external documents and artifacts. So we've, we've kind of already looked at most of these, um, but, but then we, we're putting them into place. And so the dates and the people and the titles and the places are all correct. And that gives us good evidence that the gospel accounts are believable. They are honest. They are current to the time. They, they know the right terminology. They know who was there. The dates are correct. Uh, and they describe the environment they describe that, 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 that's described in the Gospels. It's actually possible to contrast this with, with an apophrical, apophrical, apocryphal gospel um, written much later. Um, there are a number of these, and they tend to be less accurate in their attempts to portray themselves as real history. Um, they are poor copies, really, of the real gospel accounts. Just one example, um, written quite late. This is the apocryphal gospel of Barnabas, probably written about the 14th century, or maybe a little bit later. It is clearly an attempt to masquerade as a legitimate gospel record, but it fails on many levels. And one of those levels is getting history wrong. Um, so it, it's this section is talking about the, the birth of Jesus, um, uh, the, the events around the birth of Jesus. And it describes Herod the Great um, or in Judea, which was correct at that time, and Caesar Augustus, who was the, um, the emperor at the time. But then it puts that together with Pilate being governor. Well, there wasn't a governor at the time. Um, Herod was king at that time. And also it puts it in the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. And you can see what's gone on. They've, they've mixed two different passages together, Luke 3 uh, and the, the birth of Jesus. Um, and, and the dates are wrong. 
Um, Annas was high priest from AD 6 to 15, Caiaphas 18 to 36, Pilate wasn't governor until um, AD 26. Um, the other dates are, are correct. So uh, that's just a, an example, really, just to show um, when something's written later, it's a lot, it's more difficult than you think to get these things correct. And yet in the gospel records, they do incredibly well because they're recording what they see. They are of the time. The same sort of idea can be taken by looking at the gospel records of places as well as of people. Uh, and this is a list of all the places mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, at least it's my list. Uh, and I, hopefully it's got everything. There may be the odd place that I've missed. Um, but it, it, it's good there to illustrate anyway all the different places. So this is the whole New Testament. Um, if we look at the Gospels, then about a third of those places are mentioned in the Gospel. Now you might consider that's not very remarkable because um, they're just places and surely people would know. But it's important to consider that place names change. The events around the Jewish revolt in Rome in AD 67 to 70, and again, the second revolt in uh, 132 to 135, greatly changed the landscape of the region and the environment as well. And, the, and things like place names and some places even disappeared. So any late gospel account trying to portray itself as a genuine record of the times, probably written hundreds of miles away, uh, talking about Jesus' ministry, would struggle to accurately get incidental details correct. It is a couple of examples, though, where the gospel writers refer to something in passing about some of these places that tells us that they were eyewitnesses of the events. So the first example um, is in the famous story of Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. Um, there's a little detail that's almost lost in the account. John 2 verse 6 tells us about six stone water jars that were for the Jewish rites of purification. Stone water, car, water jars was something that was quite unique at the time and in that region. It was something that the Jews used for purification because you could wash a stone jar. You didn't have to break it if it became impure. If you had a, if you had a pottery jar and it became um, impure, you had to break it and have a new jar. So there's obvious reasons for that. So the top picture there shows us uh, a recently discovered quarry actually from the region of Canaan, Cana, um, I think in 2016 this was discovered um, on the building site and it, it shows um, obviously jars that were ready for construction uh, and the picture below shows some examples of those sorts of jars. So like I say, the, the jars were, were common for purification and it was something very specific to the, for this time. After AD 70, their use diminished significantly. And so it was very much a first century thing. And then after the final revolt, the Jewish revolt of AD 135, they're just not there anymore. Nobody makes them in the region at all. They, they've gone. Uh, so so that, that's one example. Another example is in John's record in chapter five, Jesus is healing a man at the pool of Bethesda. Um, he's a man who's been paralyzed for 38 years. And there's a little detail about its location and its construction. It's near the sheep gate and it has a five roofed colonnades or five porches or five porticos, depending on which um, translation of the Bible you have, um, but it's describing the same thing. The pool itself was actually discovered in 1888, which is quite a while ago. Um, but prior to that discovery, it was suggested that the story about the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda was, was a late addition to John's gospel. John didn't really write it. Somebody else wrote it and inserted it later because, uh, you know, it was thought to have a little basis in fact that the five porticos or colonnades were a bit of a mystery, suggesting that the pool had five sides, possibly like a pentagon which was unlikely, it didn't really make sense. The discovery of the pool shows that it was divided into a north and a south pool. It had a colonnade on four sides and the fifth one through the middle. And this is one representation of it um, as how it might have looked. 
And that's actually quite typical of biblical scepticism, whether it's the Gospels or elsewhere. If there's a lack of archaeological evidence, it, it's often said, oh, well, that's not part of the Gospel, or that's not, that's not part, that wasn't really something that happened. And, and yet a later discovery, when it, something like this is discovered, tends to fit perfectly with the, the, the Gospel record in this case. So the Pool of Bethesda, wasn't pentagon shaped but it did have five porticos or covered colonnades and when you look at the picture it makes absolute sense the next thing i want to think about is is the witnesses to the resurrection um so one of the remarkable characteristics of the gospel record is that the most important event it records the resurrection of jesus the key event that all four gospels lead up to is primarily witnessed by women and they are held up in the record as being the first to witness the empty tomb and the first to see Jesus alive from the dead. Now perhaps in our modern society we don't consider that particularly remarkable but in first century Judea the most underappreciated witnesses to any event would be women of low status. And it doesn't mean that their, their witness is invalid, obviously not. But due to the prejudice of the time, they just wouldn't have been taken seriously. So in John chapter 20, um, it tells us that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she found the stone taken away from the tomb. And she runs to Peter and to John to tell them what's happened. And although John focuses on Mary Magdalene, the other gospel records tell us that other women came with her too, not expecting to find Jesus alive, of course. They were coming um, to honour the dead by anointing with oils and spices, according to Jewish custom. Luke tells us that when the women came to tell the disciples what they had witnessed, they were met with scepticism. So Luke chapter 24, verses 12, uh, sorry, 10 to 12 says, now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. It is remarkable, because I've already stated, under Jewish law in, 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 under Jewish law in particular, the witness of a woman, especially a low-status woman, was considered of no value. And it, it sometimes suggested that maybe under Roman law, the witness of a woman was admissible. But the reality of that was that any such woman whose witness was admissible had to be very high ranking, had to be a Roman citizen uh, for her witness to be taken seriously. And even then, the respect that she had came from that derived from her father or from her husband. It was just the, the way of the society in those days. The women who witnessed the resurrection were generally or would be generally thought of as of no consequence by society. They in particular were a very low rank, had little if any status, and yet the gospel records consider them as primary witnesses. What they saw and heard was written down as evidence. So the gospel records, all four of them, for me, because of that, have a strong ring of truth. If you wanted to make up a powerful case, you would choose men as witnesses and high-ranking high ones at that. But because the records are honest and particularly written at the time when the witnesses were still alive and therefore could be questioned and, and so you could ask them what they saw, the records tell us what actually happened they ring true. There's no point lying about it when it's at that time because, well, you, there's nobody to ask. You would go to them, they wouldn't have a true witness. You would know they weren't a true witness. To those who believed, these witnesses were not rejected because they were women. They were valuable, honest witnesses of a remarkable event. They were people you could ask to tell you what they saw and experienced. The Gospel writers did just that and wrote it down for us to read. Perhaps additionally noteworthy is 
the men who are written into the record aren't very believing, they're very skeptical. Um, to the, the apostles, the women's words seem like an idle tale and they didn't believe them. Peter and John are recorded as responding but doubting the women. They're recorded as being fearful and hiding in the upper room. Thomas is a famous example who wouldn't believe until he physically saw, saw the physical appearance of Jesus and, and only if he could touch and see would he believe. He wasn't prepared to believe otherwise. Again, it's the ring of truth. Men would, in those days, perhaps want to um, make out that they were better than that, but it tells you as it is. The final piece of evidence I'd like to look at um, is the way that the Gospels are written themselves. There are three synoptic Gospels. The synoptic basically means they're similar in, in what they recount and what they portray. It doesn't mean they're identical, but they are. Um, they, have, uh, they, they go through similar events um, and, and in quite harmony with each other. And then there's John's gospel record, and that recounts the same ministry of Jesus, but it goes into much more detail about specific events, and it particularly looks at the end, the last weeks of Jesus' life prior to his crucifixion and then after his resurrection. The example I'd like to take comes quite early in Jesus' three and a half year ministry and recounts a time when Jesus is teaching a loud, large crowd from within a house and a paralyzed man from birth is brought to Jesus for Jesus to heal him. And it's reported in Matthew, Mark and Luke's gospel records, those synoptic gospels. So in Matthew chapter nine, we read that Jesus crossed and came to the city and behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Now that's Mark, Matthew's gospel. Matthew actually doesn't give us as much detail as Mark and Luke. They both talk about the same event um, and where the different accounts meet, they agree. Both Mark and Luke though give extra details. Mark tells us that four men came carrying the paralyzed man on his bed, which will be something like a stretcher, I imagine. And both Mark and Luke tell us that the crowd was impossible to get through. There were so many people, they just couldn't get to where Jesus was. So instead, they climb onto the roof, remove the tiles, and let the man down in front of Jesus. So though the accounts are different, they harmonise. They read like different eyewitness accounts of the same event. G uh, sorry, Matthew is giving the essential information. Mark and Luke add details and set the scene. And, and that's typical of the gospel accounts, different people witnessing events and recalling them for us. Uh, and they, they, they agree um, in the details that match. It must also be said that they were obviously impressed by what Jesus could do. Many of his miracles were recalled in the gospels. Now, sometime later, particularly like, our time, miraculous events are often generally, you would consider them difficult to believe. They are by the very definition of, of the word miraculous, they are out of the ordinary. They, they, they're not what normally happens. And so they're difficult to believe when you don't see them for yourself. However, each of the gospel writers felt compelled to write about either what they saw themselves or what the witnesses they consulted saw, and they were prepared to die for the conviction that these things were true. The harmony and the believability of the witness statements and the conviction of those who saw and believed, for me, are actually very powerful and convincing evidence. You wouldn't say those things and die for them if you didn't think they were true, if you hadn't witnessed them yourself. There's another important aspect to this encounter with Jesus. It isn't just an amazing event being recalled to mind by witnesses. This is one of the things that I find intriguing about the gospel record. Jesus clearly had a message to teach. And in one sense, the, the astounding miracle of healing a man 
who had been paralysed at birth so that he could walk away and carry his bed with him, is secondary to this story. It's not the most important thing. And this is shown by, by what Jesus says in this account. So just consider that the house is packed and full of people. There are people looking in through the windows. They're looking in through the doors. The house is absolutely full, and Jesus is in the house teaching. And then above them, the tiles of the roof begin to move. Some light comes in as the tiles are removed. And everybody's going to notice that. The owner of the house is likely to get pretty annoyed. I would imagine he's not on his own. There would other people be shouting up, saying, what on earth are you doing? Bits of masonry and plaster are likely to fall into the room. And maybe even, well, maybe even the old tile might fall down and smash on the floor. I don't know. It's quite a dramatic and very public scene, isn't it? When eventually the man is lowered in front of Jesus, Jesus command, commends them for their faith, which is shown by their determination and their resourcefulness to get this man in front of Jesus. They are determined. But then Jesus, instead of saying, rise up and walk, says to the man, your sins are forgiven you. Absolutely nobody expected that. That was the last thing they expected him to say. So why did Jesus say it? What was he saying? Well, what Jesus isn't saying is that this man is in this state because he's a sinner more than everybody else. He, he has done something that really means he deserves this condition. And it can't be, can it? He was born this way. Sin doesn't mean that you are a worse person than anybody else. If you want to understand sin, the, the general meaning me is to miss the mark. Imagine archery. You, you shoot an arrow. You miss the bullseye by a mile on the target. You're missing the mark. And that's the idea behind the word sin. Uh, and biblically, it's to either intentionally or even unintentionally go against God. It's something, well, everybody does, me included. We all do that. We all fail to live up to God's standard. If paralysis was directly caused by sin, we would all be physically disabled in some way. Jesus is making a much more important point, and that is that he came to forgive sins. Criticise Jesus if you like like those religious leaders did at that time, for taking too much on himself. They accused him of blasphemy. So in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 4, it says, But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. There's no argument, is there? The purpose of the narrative, the purpose of what Jesus did and said then was to show that he had a message of salvation. We might all miss the mark. We might all sin before God. But Jesus was bringing forgiveness, a gospel of forgiveness and of compassion, not just for God or for to forgive me. But then I pass that on in the way that I live my life. It has to change, change me as well. So. Those are some of my reasons for believing that the Gospels are true, whether it's the fact that it's rooted in history, that it involves real people, that the archaeology agrees, that there's incidental evidence, the example of the female witnesses, or it's the accounts themselves, the way they harmonise together, that there are honest accounts, that the message is coherent, that it's a really remarkable message and one that is, is worth living up to. All of these come together. I, I'm not sure whether I covered absolutely everything on my list, but if you're interested in those 
things. You can check um, out some of the other videos in the Gospel Online YouTube channel. Um, don't forget to subscribe, and then you can see some of those other videos. And don't forget to click the, click the bell, and you can be notified of the videos coming up each week. So thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.